So. Very good. Baruch Atah Adinai Lehne Melechei Elam Shehat Kol Nebi Gvarim. Amen. Chaim, everybody. Chaim. And that's the same blessing over the sushi, by the way. It's a shahako. It's okay. Welcome, everybody around the table, everybody around the world, <laughs> Montreal and beyond. L'chaim. And welcome for advice for life. The Lubavitcher Rebbe's guidance towards a more meaningful, purposeful life. Now, I've been doing JLI now for just 20 years. Yeah. And I must say, I'm always excited to teach a JLI course because they are superb. Um, the way they're written, structured, it's amazing. But I must say that this particular course, I am actually more excited than... Maybe for the last 10 years, the courses that I've been giving. And because that's something that's very dear and near to my heart. Being that I'm a shliach of the Rebbe, an emissary of the Rebbe, and I feel that that is my uh, greatest um, claim to fame. <laughs> yes, I'm a father of 10 and a grandfather of many more. Uh, Baruch Hashem. But I really credit that to my connection to the Rebbe. As a Rebbe is my teacher, my mentor, my um, father, as I and king, <laughs> all in one. <laughs> so um, anything that I am is thanks to him. That's how I feel, and therefore, getting teachings that are based from on from him directly and how that guides our lives, um, to me, is of utmost value and importance. So, I'm going to share the screen over here. Let's hope this works well. Yeah, you have it there? Mm -hmm. Wow. We're off to, we're off and running. Okay. Is that the way we want it? Not necessarily, but let's see if we do something here. Uh, there we go. Oh, now we're talking. All right. Uh, no, we're not talking. <laughs> it's only here that it's working. It's not working online. I can share the screen again. Okay. Where am I going? Stop share and reshare. I thought it. Okay. And now I'm going here to this one, right? How's it over here? It's good. How's it over there? All right. Fine. We're good. We make it good. How do I get rid of it? Okay. All right. There we go. So the Rebbe born in 1902 in Ukraine. We could most definitely say has impacted uh, the Jewish world and beyond the Jewish world, um, beyond um, compare. And especially when you consider that in 1940, when the previous Rebbe came to America, and when the Rebbe took over the leadership in 1950, and taking over the leadership in 1950, a Fabringen was held in the upstairs uh, um, study hall that un uncomfortably would fit 100 people. That's what it was back in the day. Um, 
And today we're talking about, you know, 5,000 Chabad houses throughout the world. So the Rebbe's visionary uh, leadership qualities are obviously remarkable. And he has, of course, improved the lives spiritually and materially. Jewish people, there's probably no one, almost no Jew throughout the world that has not been touched directly or indirectly by by the Rebbe. Um, and the title, you know, the Rebbe is unique in the fact that there are other Rebbes from other dynasties, but the Rebbe is unique. And when you say the Rebbe, everybody knows who we're talking about. So the impact and the leadership is something well-known, but something that's less well-known is the Rebbe's extraordinary genius in Torah study. If you will, if you look in the back over there, you see that top shelf of the black svarim? That's from the Rebbe's from Ringens until 1992 from 1980. That's 12 years, right? If you have the rest of the other 30 years of, so you're talking about taking up maybe the whole back shelf over there, just about. Or maybe that is, one second, maybe I'm mistaken. No, that is. Um, so that's only the talks themselves. But then you have what's the 36 volumes that I'm involved right now, myself with many others, learning two sikhas, two teachings a week. And that'll take us 10 years to finish 36 volumes. That's how much there is uh, of the Rebbe's uh, teachings. And then there is the thousands of letters. The thousands of letters that the Rebbe wrote to individuals. But before we get any further, let's get some... Uh, a collage of noted personalities and ooh, what they have to say about the Rebbe. Hold on one second. Realize I have to do something when we do that. Optimize it. And then... Okay. We're good. It isn't only the uh, Jewish community that values him. It's the worldwide community. And so many come here to receive his blessing. Today, the Rebbe will be sincerely awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. A man who dedicated his life to helping others and to bringing people together. The Speaker of the House and I have many disagreements, but there's one thing, there is at least one thing on which we do agree, that is the awarding of this medal. This award, it brought Democrats and Republicans, liberals, conservatives, northerners and southerners, blacks, whites, and Hispanics, it brought us all together. Well, I remember the 70th birthday, people say that he was the new Bar Shem Tov. I rather compared him to the Maggot of Meserich. Although he never moved, he didn't travel. The Tovber of Maserich was the one actually who had built. The Rebbe was like the Maggot. He had vision and wisdom and knowledge and everything else. But in, in practical life, he was an architect. He, he knew whom to send where. I think the Shariah himself didn't know why he was sent somewhere, but he knew. The Rebbe was an architect in this part, in this respect. He knew how to build. And uh, therefore, I uh, have asked for the blessings of uh, the rabbi, of our great teacher. Um, rabbi Schneerson is a great man in Israel. All of us respect him. All of us accept his judgment. He is a great uh, lover of the house of Israel. He has uh, shown his deep sentiment and love for our children. His blessings are very important to me. I do hope they will strengthen me on that very important mission I am going to fulfill uh, during the meetings with uh, President Carter, the President of the United States. 
a unique personality. No doubt that serves as a leader for tremendous number of Jewish people, a person that on one hand lives in the world of the Torah, but has got practical sense to the realities of the life everywhere in the world and great sensitivity for the preserving of the Jewish people. So as I said, being a shliach, of course I am biased <laughs> about the magnificence, the greatness of the Rebbe as a leader, no doubt. But I think the facts do speak for themselves and other, others speak about the Rebbe. Now, the fact that leaders would want to s s sought out his guidance rabbis and educators, heads of organizations, that's understandable. But what's surprising is that a good part, if not the greater part of what he wrote and even spoke about, even though there were Torah teachings, but they were about the mundane life, day-to-day -day living, whether it was about health, whether it was about education, career, marriage, emotional health, you name it. The Rebbe spoke about it. He wrote about it to individuals. Now, to get a blessing from a Rebbe, who is a righteous individual, that makes sense. You get that. You know, I asked two times for physical things that I had, I needed a blessing for, getting four wisdom teeth removed, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I had a back, bad back, the sciatica that was on my back for two weeks. In the first instance, the Rebbe gave me a blessing, Askelah Latzin, you remember at the at the great site, and uh, I, four wisdom teeth taken out, I didn't take any medicine, nothing. I mean, extraction that was put under, it was, you know, 45 years ago that that happened. And then for my back, the Rebbe said to check your twill and the mezuzahs, and interestingly enough, I had just checked him three months earlier. But they never said, you know what you do? You listen, got him checked, got them checked, and there was some problems with my mezuzahs. Got them fixed, and things got better. So those things people were familiar with. But to get advice when it comes to mundane matters, right, whether it's business issues, health issues, you should go to the expert in the field. The people went to the Rebbe, right? They went to the Rebbe. And, and, and again, most of the responses that, that are written in, in the Geras, in, in the uh, letters, are about mundane issues of life. By the dollars, the famous dollar lines from 1986 to 1992, where thousands of people every Sunday would come by for dollars, um, those questions were also asked for the most part. So we're going to return to that. How is it that the Rebbe can respond to these things? How do we understand that? The fact is he did, but we'll get back there. Let's begin. Let us begin um, with some questions. Exercise 1.1. You have it on page four in so what is the Jewish view of, wor of work, career, and wealth? Back. Our books will be coming, God willing, in uh, the middle of the week. You found there? Yeah? Okay. There's pens there too. So in your estimation, what is the Jewish religious view on work and career? You have A, B, C, or D. In your estimation for when, uh, number two, what is the Jewish religious view on affluence? So if you have any, okay. All right, good, perfect. Anybody, any thoughts? 
Huh? Mm -hmm. B for, okay, part and parcel of the Jew. Okay. Is encouraged. Okay. Huh? You took C? Depends on? Okay. Depends on? No, no. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, the first one, C. Both C. Okay. Good. Excellent. Welcome, Hannah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Let's go to the Torah view on wealth, and we will see that it's not so simple. It's a little complicated. Let's start with the first two verses. Okay. Deuteronomy. We have a verse that says, Yeshurim, which refers to the Jewish people, grew fat and kicked, meaning they rebelled. You grew fat, thick, rotund. Israel forsook the God who made them and spurned the rock of their salvation. Text number 1b from Proverbs, King Solomon and his great wisdom. A poor person speaks with supplication. A rich person relies on impudence. Hmm. So is that an argument for wealth or against wealth? I um, No, not from this. That would be an argument against wealth. It, the issue is complicated, but those verses seem pretty clear, right? The first verse is telling us that what? Um, greed, indulgence, self-absorption. Because we grew fat, in other words, with plenty, with abundance. That's what the first text is telling us. The second text is telling us Arrogance, inflated sense of self-importance, and contempt and disrespect for others. That's the message of the second text. Do you have to agree with it? What you, you, I mean, you want to argue with King Solomon? Um, you know, <laughs> you know, you, that's pretty. But, but, you know, I, I don't know if uh, if uh, human nature has changed that much, <laughs> right? No, I don't think human nature has necessarily changed, right? But in any case, that, I, I'm not certain that it's about agreeing or disagreeing over here. It's about we're trying to understand the Rebbe and his teachings. So how do we understand the Rebbe and his guidance? We first have to go to the Torah and see what Torah says, right? So here's statements that would suggest that abundance can lead to definitely, you know, a slippery slope. No question about that. Right? And because of that back backdrop, and that's what's important over here is having that backdrop, so that we can understand how remarkable the Rebbe's perspective on this is. The Rebbe in 1958 made a shiva call to a, a Rebbe, a Kop, uh, the Kopitzin Rebbe, Rebbe Yush, uh, Avram Yeshua Heschel. And uh, in their discussion, they were speaking about Torah institutions and the need for funding for Torah institutions and so on. And text number two is a transcript of that discussion. Sugezund, the Rebbe, Jewish individuals need to secure financial security. And that is important, positive and appropriate goal in and of itself, regardless of the additional imperative to fund Torah institutions in specific locations. What's the Rebbe saying there? In other words, you, we should have wealth regardless of supporting the institutions that need to be supported. That's what the Rebbe said, right? Financial success enables Jews to live comfortably and expansively, and they will also enable them to broaden their perspectives. Our sages taught that a beautiful home expands one's mind, and they meant in the most literal sense, if only all Jewish people would be wealthy, the Rebbe says in 1958. Right, the Kupnich is a Rebbe. Wealth is a challenge. I fear the test that it possesses. He responded to the Rebbe. Right, the Rebbe responded. Poverty is equally a challenge. If there must be a challenge, the test of wealth is preferable over that of poverty. God will certainly help us successfully withstand the challenge. Ooh, wow. So the Rebbe uh, in their conversation. It seems the Rebbe is very much when Jews get together, and especially when two 
lofty souls like they get together, that if they come to an agreement on something, that that has an effect in heaven. So the Rebbe wanted very much that he should agree with the idea. And he said to him, do you agree that Jews should be blessed with wealth? And the Rebbe said, wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> and in the end, he said, yes. Mm. Uh, it, it seemed to be a, like a heaven, like, you know, heaven, listen, <laughs> we decided on earth here. This is what the Jews need. Wealth. <laughs> and as the Rebbe said, wealth is a test. And in fact, it is. But poverty is also a test. How so? How so? Oh, keep the faith in tough times. Exactly. It's not so easy, right? Is it easy to focus on your prayers and your Torah study? Maybe right now some of you are going through difficulties and it's difficult to you to focus, right? And if you had expansiveness in wealth, then you'd have expansiveness in mind and heart and spiritually. That's what the Rebbe says, right? And he was very adamant about it. That uh, seeing it as a divine blessing that everyone should have and even pursue. That's quite powerful. Fine. Now, to bring this out even more so, this is Purim 1955. I wasn't born yet. And around the room here, I won't say who was. <laughs> <laughs> We'll start with Purim 1955, when the Rebbe spoke about the test of wealth, and then made an incredible offer. We were sitting by a Fabringen, and the Rebbe said that anyone who wants to become wealthy, raise your hand. Now, who has the audacity that I should ask the Rebbe about Gashmias? The Rebbe is for Ruchnistik, so most of the people wouldn't have the audacity to raise their hand. <laughs> Reb Shmuel Isaac Popak was said to have raised his hand, a fact that he would never confirm or deny, although he always told the story. Six or seven people raised their hands, and they all became millionaires. Subsequently, I asked the Rebbe for a broche. I had no panosa at all, and the Rebbe told me I should go into real estate, which I did. And I told the Rebbe I had no money. The Rebbe says, you don't need money to go into real estate. <laughs> so through certain maneuvering, we were able to buy two houses without any cash. That started us off in the real estate business. And thank God we make a living. Understatement. Understatement. Yeah, passed away a few years ago and left for six children, tens of millions each. <laughs> tens of millions each. Tens. Huh? You'll have to go and ask him. <laughs> uh, uh, yes so so then the obvious question though why would a spiritual leader right advocates affluence right you know on a Chabad house what are we trying to do here what are you doing here now am I teaching you how to become Successful business people? No. Learning Torah. Tomorrow morning, come and daven with us. And after davening, you know what we're going to do? We're going to learn some more Torah. <laughs> Yet, the Rebbe, who is the ultimate spiritual leader, 
he's advocating this affluence. So we need to understand. So to appreciate the Rebbe's stance on wealth, we got to zoom out a little and get a little perspective on work in general, concept of work. How does society view work? How does the Rebbe view work? Of course, all based on the Torah. So society, how does it view work? Simply, it's a necessary evil. I'd rather be playing golf or tennis or on a yacht than going to work. But work you got to do because after all, you got to take care of yourself. You got to take care of you have a family. You have responsibility, right? But it's only a means to an end. What I really want is the pleasures of life. And work, not necessarily is where that pleasure might be, even though perhaps it might be. But um, even if those who do enjoy their job, to a large degree, what motivates them is simple. I need to work. I don't want to work necessarily, but I need to work, right? The Rebbe, however, looked at things differently. He saw that every part of life is purposeful including work and your career. So meaning obtaining a livelihood um, has inherent value to it. It needs, it aligns with a sense of purpose, irrespective of what you do, not just as a rabbi or a doctor, but even if you are a custodian somewhere <laughs> of doing whatever it is, it is inherent value and purpose. That's unique. Now, this fits in with a very foundational idea that many of you have heard before, but it's unique in, in Chabad teachings, I must tell you. It's unique in Chabad teachings because it's based on the Torah. It's, it's a medrash. But, you know, it's not a medrash that is repeated over and over like many other midrashim that will be repeated over and over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, a reoccurring message. But it is that the purpose of creation is to make this world into a habitation for God. That this physical reality should be transparent to the divine reality. That a mundane world should shine with godliness, with holiness. That's the purpose. And therefore, we engage in the material world, even though it might be a crass world, in order to what we call a dir a dwelling place for God in this world. Right? Let's take the argument a little further. You might ask, why? That's the purpose? The purpose isn't to sit and learn a whole day and pray a whole day? I mean, come on, you're in Chabad house. I want you to be here all day tomorrow because I'm, uh, you know, it gets lonely that I have to learn by myself. <laughs> right? So let's look at life. The truth is, how much of our day do we spend in spiritual stuff and how much of our day we spend in mundane activity, right? Mundane activity is much more. Going to work, if you're working an eight-hour day or if you're working at home and now, you know, <laughs> might be less hours, but it takes up much more than the time that you dive in more uh, the time that you learn. So most of your day is really made up of mundane activity. Let's look on how God creates the world. Six days, he works to create a world, and the seventh day, he rests. Likewise, we work for six days. Seven days, we rest. One day that's dedicated to God, right? And the rest is dedicated to Dafmach and Aladdin. That's the way it is on a weekly basis. That's the way it is on a daily basis, as the Rebbe explains. Text number three, please. Mm 
The Torah's perspective of Jewish life is puzzling. It informs us that God chose us to rest uh, uh, from the rest of humanity and spiritually elevated us from regular people. That creates the impression that we must spend the majority of our time in sacred pursuits, studying Torah, performing mitzvahs, and worshiping in, in the tabernacle or later in the Jerusalem temple. Why then does the Torah itself establish that the majority of the Jewish individual's life is to be devoted to material pursuits in which there is no distinction between Jew and anyone else? The explanation is that the purpose for which God created the world is that God desired that we actively turn this material world with all its corporeality and material coarseness into a dwelling for God himself through serving God in this world in accordance with Torah that he gave us. To achieve this, the majority and the main thrust of our daily service of God is not strictly spiritual activities. After all, our spiritual activities are comparable to the divine service performed by souls before they enter the world and after they return to heaven. Rather, we spend most of our time specifically on interaction with materiality. Therefore, the Torah emphasizes, for six years you shall sow your field. The idea is bring sanctity and divinity down into your fields, the coarse realm of materiality, so as to turn our material and corporal world into a home for God. If the purpose of the world was to be in a holy environment only, to seclude ourselves, well, then God would have created the, the Torah's teachings and the way of life is that we could be cloistered. That's not what he's looking for. The purpose is to bring holiness into such places that would otherwise not have it, right? Why is it that way? Is because the ultimate purpose, the ultimate purpose is to, uh, to have a physical world governed by the ethics of Torah teachings and values. That is the purpose. That this world should be a shining, we should be shining role models despite of all of the hustle and bustle and the pulls that we have by a mundane world that lacks any spirituality that in this world right that we can then make it into one that's filled with goodness and godliness and that's a spiritual mission that's an end in itself so we have a mission in everything that we do we bring holiness and Torah values into the workplace is the ultimate purpose of creation. Actually, so interesting and how crucial it is. The first thing that we're asked when we go after 120 is not how much Torah you studied. That will be your second question. Get ready for that. That's the second question, though. The first question is, did you do business and your business dealings or your dealings in the material world with faith and trust in God? In other words, being honest and, and everything that we're learning over here. So that is our first point. Second point is, in addition to the spiritual purpose, the workplace is something unique. What's unique about the workplace? Is you reach people where they're at, right? When people come here, they... First of all, not everybody comes here, as is evident online and evident around the table. There are more people at the workplace than there are coming to synagogue, right? <laughs> so first of all, when they come here, they're on their best behavior. When they're at work, they might be on a different level of behavior. Secondly, I only reach people that will come here or try to reach them elsewhere. But when you are in business and you are dealing with people in your business, you're peer to peer, right? That you're reaching out to them. So this is another important element of why we have to deal and engage in the material world because then we meet people who are in the material world who are not spiritually enlightened and spiritually imbued with Jewish values and teachings. And we need to be a positive influence we need to be a positive influence and make a difference in their lives. Text number four, please. My grandfather, Reb Shmuel of Lubavitch, the fourth Lubavitcher Rebbe, the 
uh, had a close follower by the name of Elia Abeller, who, in terms of scholarship and aptitude, was a simple fellow. In one of Abeller's private audiences with my grandfather, he was told, Elia, I envy you. You travel to various fairs where you meet many people. In the middle of a business transaction, you get into a spirited discussion over a Torah insight. Something inspirational you recall from the public Ein Yaakov class that retells stories and ethical teachings from the Talmud. When you do that, you arouse the other person's interest, interest in studying Torah. This activity causes much joy on high. God rewards such trade with blessings of children, wealth, and sustenance. The larger the fair, the more work there is, and the greater is the livelihood earned. Let us see more on that in the following video. I just started a new job in IBM and Hey Tavis comes along and the Rebbe says on that day that everybody should be like a shliach. I didn't know what did the Rebbe mean everybody should be a shliach. Maybe he means that I gotta quit my job and like stop becoming a campus shliach or something like that. I wrote into the Rebbe, should I give up my job for IBM? What is it that the Rebbe wants? And the Rebbe like underlines it on the answer and with a big, just one word question, word answer, Lama, why do you have to give up your job in IBM? I want you to stay in those things and be my shliach. <laughs> אז הוא ארקומת, הוא נבוא שר המים ודמאסי ברקומת, דולר דורקין, שמי פונדי מי בשקין, דולר דורקין, מחון דו סינדיף, מזלזיין לשקין, ביד ושכן כי בסייכם, עוד נמדיק, איזי נאגן נדלי דמיס, ונוח דלייך, על פסר בייסי מבחוץ. And that was what I ended up doing. I stayed in IBM. I had a very, very much uh, career. So if you would give a warm round of applause for Mr. Moshe Rappaport from IBM. But I felt all the time that I was doing shlichas. In other words, I would make speeches all over the world. Your desktop or on your wall, oh, you're going to be wearing and so on that are AI driven. But the real... All through my career, I would write to the Rebbe what was going on, what I was doing. Be secure. How are we going to manage the access control? Tough people, CEOs, politicians, famous journalists from all over the world came to find out what IBM was doing in research. And I got to meet all these people with my yarmulke, with my beard, and so on and so forth. And Jewish people came over to me. And it was actually a shliach in that sense. You certainly know that now Hong Kong is a visiting place for many Jews from several countries. And then you can influence the during their visit in Hong Kong, when they are returning to their homes, they will bring with them a vision of Yerushalayim. And that will be your, your business also. Yeah. אני במקרה נאיב לארקיטקט, יש לי מפעל בארץ גדול, בייחוד ברכתו מלפני שנתיים, במכתב שכבודו כתב לי, שקיבלתי ממנו, קיבלנו עבודה גדולה מאוד, שני מיליון דולר, מצבא ארצות הברית, חודש אחרי המכתב, חודש אחרי קבלת המכתב, קיבלנו את העבודה הכי גדולה בחיינו, מהצבא האמריקאי. אני מקווה, אני משתדל, והרבה עובדים שלי שלא היו ירי שמיים, כשזה קרה, חזרו בתשובה. וזה הודות לכבוד הרב. עדיין עולה עליך להוסיף עוד יותר בירושלים שלו, כאילו שלמכוך יירו ויעשו קרליך על כל פונים החצי ממך. major exhibition that we exhibited at was in Brussels, was a major upholstery fabric international exhibition. Part of our display was knowing that if an, a Jew came in there, 
he knew he would get caught and trying me asking him if he could put on film. The exhibition is going to be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Rosh Hashanah was coming up Monday night. They're coming for one half a day on Monday exhibition. It's a little bit crazy. On the other hand, I knew the Rebbe wanted we should always be at the exhibition. So, we're going. Rabbi Kharikov let me know that the Rebbe suggested that we put up a sign at the beginning of the show that due to the Sabbath, we're going to be closed at Friday, 2.30. So the customers, they'll know in the beginning of the show, they should come into you right away. At about 1.30, suddenly I see a gentleman walking up and down past our stand where there's thousands of people walking. But I see he keeps looking at the sign and he's asking, tell me, what is this closing the Sabbath? It's an international exhibition. What's this closing Rosh Hashanah? I said, where are you from, sir? He says, ich bin apoilische. I saw it dealing with a Jew. He said, how about putting on film? He looks at me like I went crazy. Crazy. Is it film? Who believes in all of this? I don't believe in God. I don't believe in anything. He says, ich bin durchgegangen Hitler. I want you Hitler. But I never put on film, he says. And I said, my friend, I understand you 100%. Once in your lifetime, you didn't have a bonus, you said. You'll be able to say, you're right, God wasn't right to you, and you had a bar mitzvah. He took off his jacket, and we put him on film. The minute he said, Shema Yisrael, he broke down and started crying. He says, Ich kennish. He was holding us out, Ich kennish. And he sat down, and he didn't know what to do, how to thank us. You can imagine how we felt. Business, we didn't do that much, but we knew what we came for, and we knew we are going to have a good year. <laughs> on the contrary, sometimes that's why you're going on the business, is because of those connections that you have to make, and the lives that we need to inspire and to influence. Um, so that's the second point. The spiritual purpose of a career, a workplace affords unique opportunities to inspire others to be better people and better Jews. Okay. So we mentioned before, you know, that uh, we all work, need to make a living. We want uh, our families to to have the things that they need. And that's normal. But the Alter Rebbe in Tanya has a different point of view on this. Very, very extreme, actually. Text number five. Who is like you, people of your people of Israel? One unique nation on earth. The implication is that even while they engage in mundane matters on earth, they do not separate themselves from the true one, from God. It is therefore appropriate that we do not perform all of our mundane engagements for material ends, but rather in order to bring sustenance to other souls, pieces of godliness, and to supply them with which they, which they lack out of gratuitous kindness towards them. In doing so, we resemble our creator, the one God, for God performs free kindness at all times and his kindness is true not for recompense in that he animates the universe and in all of its contents every single moment let's take this apart from him because this is very heavy uh concept over here so the idea over here is to be like god but what is god god is creating us out of his kindness every single moment so to be like god means we have to animate other people's lives and give them at all times. And actually, it's not quoted over here, but he does say in this letter over here that we have the responsibility for every Jew equally. And the only reason why our own family comes first is because the Torah says so. But as far as a sense of responsibility, a sense of commitment is to all. 
the whole community of Israel. But there's a priority. You got to take care of your family first. You got to take care of your extended, your community here before you take a community elsewhere. But in reality, it's everyone. Chassidim have a, an old saying of Chassidim that in my piece of in my piece of bread is your sustenance too. And as I don't look that I'm going to work to sustain me and my family, because if I were to do that we would be like everybody else. All nations of the world do that. That's human. To be divine is I'm not going to work to sustain my family. I'm going to work to sustain everybody that I can sustain and help. Yes, my priority is first family because I'm obliged to. But, but in that sense, it's that's divine. That's pure. That's altruistic. Right instead of self-directed and self-centered. Now, no one can take it away from anybody that goes to work and to sustain their family. We're not taking it away from anybody, but that's not acting like God. And we have a mitzvah to act like God, and then that way we act like Him. In other words, we have a responsibility to all. Is that clear? Yes. So as a result, what does that mean as a result? Okay, we have responsibility. So in 1959, uh, my, one of my teachers, his brother in, in, in Kfar Chabad was a farmer and he had his means and he was doing okay. Opportunity came in, 19, in 1959, he became a farmer. In 1970, he had an opportunity that he could purchase uh, a larger area of land and a cheap price and the potential of revenue would be enormous. He wrote and said, Rebbe, Rebbe, I don't know if I should do this. I've got enough. And I'm afraid that it might take away from other things in my life, like my Torah study and you know other things. The Rebbe told him, no, go for it. You should go for it. Um... Text number six. You question whether you, it is appropriate for you to desire to further expand your income. That question has already been answered. 10% of earnings must be given to charity. And ideally, for those who wish to step beyond the basic requirement and enhance their observance, 20%. In fact, Rabbi Shneer Zalman of Liadi, the Alter Rebbe, the author of Tanya, first Chabad Rebbe, explains that it is appropriate to give even more than that. This is especially relevant now that the institutions that require our charitable support require expansion, and therefore their financial needs are constantly growing as well. Con co consequently, additional charity is required, and that demands greater income. <laughs> so go to work so you can make more money. Why? Because we're responsible for the community. Now, that doesn't mean everybody. That's to say, you know, it's, it's not an answer to everybody across the board. Some people, maybe they shouldn't. They don't need to do that because they have another type of responsibility because maybe their influence on people is greater and they're going to go teach people Torah and therefore they're going to spend time doing that rather than going into business. So it's not carte blanche we're talking about here. We're talking about an attitude, though, that is counterintuitive, though. We wouldn't think this way. What do you mean? He's a religious Jew. He's, he's doing okay. He doesn't need he, he tells it Rebbe, I don't really need this. I'm okay. You don't need it, but the institutions need it. The community needs it. And I guess he wasn't the teacher, right? He wasn't the, or the community leader and that he was an organizer in other manners in other ways, right? And therefore he wasn't needed in that realm. So what do you know what you're needed for? Your purpose is go to work and make more money. And so. And with that, another wonderful video. I'm kidding? Yeah, yeah. That's why the side, they
Was für ein Käfen? Die, die Rietungszahl? Die ganzen Käfen? Die ganzen Käfen, ja. Das ist erst äh, der Umstand, dass er nicht so sehr geht. Sagt sie so, sie sind eine Company, der Mensch mit neuen Zeit sagt, dass sie wachsen können, andere, andere Menschen kommen rein mit der Sache, mit dem Geld. Aber das ist eine gute Sache, aber das ist eine gute Sache. Nein, nicht, aber nicht. Sie wissen doch einfach, dass sie... Nein, mit dem Mannchen, ich sehe, ich komme zu einem Aktivparkäfen. Aber eben mit dem Geld, das sie in Vakuum investieren, das ist ein Investment in mein Geschäft. Aber mit Waffen sein weiter aktiv mit der Wirkstelle, da hat er sehr viele Volgemsdeutsche, Volgemsdeutsche, die Besitzer, die hier nicht mehr so viel Volgemsdeutsche, 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 die hier nicht mehr so viel He wants an easy out. The Rebbe is not giving him an easy out. Why? Because he doesn't say because you should, you can have more. He didn't say that that way you can buy a yacht, right? He said because you're going to give more. Because we have that the basis of it is as the Alter Rebbe writes there, is right. We are not like the nations of the world that we just take care of what's my personal needs, which is my family. My personal responsibility. Our responsibility is the entire community. Right? That's our responsibility. Now, how that shapes itself, you know, I do that as more as a teacher than... <laughs> right? Uh, as a rabbi. But that's me. Most people are not like me. Most people work. So don't give an excuse why you're not making lots of money. <laughs> work make lots of money not because you need it because i need it <laughs> very good <laughs> with that l'chaim a bracha i'm giving everybody over here you should be exceedingly wealthy l'chaim wealthy and wealthy yeah <laughs> all right <laughs> <laughs> All right. Exercise 1.2 on page 15, please. What do you consider the optimal age for retirement? <laughs> 39, right? You wanted four you wanted 40. Not not pet. Post 70. Post 70. 40 retirement. Yeah, it depends on how you define retirement. I mean, Rather that you don't go to work. You don't go, you don't go to work. I, we didn't ask you, your opinion. Uh, we asked your opinion. We didn't ask okay, the Rebbe's opinion. opinion. Your opinion. Yes. We want your opinion. We didn't ask your okay. opinion. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as of 2021, the average age of retirement in North America is 65 for men and 62 for women. And of course, people look forward for retirement, if they're financially secure, that is. Right? Uh, because without work, now they can enjoy life, the golden years, right? But I think you can, as you've picked up from now, what the Jewish perspective and definitely what the Rebbe's perspective on this is, is that... Um, and, and by the way, only because what you've learned till now, if you will not, you know, we're learning the Rebbe's teachings for the way based in Torah, but if you will go elsewhere, not Chabad teachings, right? Not the Rebbe's teachings, you might not get the same picture, right? On the, what do you mean? Of course, retire, because now I could go sit and learn Torah a whole day. I could daven longer. I might be able to go volunteer and do things and so on and so forth. And, and there's an argument to be made for that, right? There is an argument to be made for that, right? And again, we can't strike the brush across for everybody is exactly the same. But the uniqueness over here is not to retire, right? That's what we, that's what's surprising that you, sh that you shouldn't retire. 
That's the Rebbe tells us. certainly continuing it, not to, to think him about retiring, you must uh, gain much more money to give, to give much more zdoka and to do so in good mood and good health together with your family. And things are moving along well and I'm not going to retire. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you forget about it. <laughs> forget about it. <laughs> yeah, forget about it. Forget the Rebbe led by example. 1972, the Rebbe turned Yudalev Nissen, 70 years old, and he got many letters from people, people who are followers, even Rebbe, you know, slow down a bit. And the Rebbe's pace was quite, you know, quite a quick one. And slowed down a bit. And the Rebbe said, no, quite the opposite. God gives another year. Therefore, we got to do more. And in that year, he asked that there should be 71 new institutions that should be created throughout the year. Um, and um, that our efforts should become greater and greater. So the Rebbe is very adamantly against. Why? Well, because retirement means... That everything that you've done till now at work was not only a means to an end. It was not an end in itself. What we just learned are three reasons why they're an end in themselves. Because the whole purpose is the mundane world, making a dwelling place for God. So if you are an honest person in your work and you bring sanctity in the workplace, the influence that you have in others and what the and the tzedakah, the good that you can do when the charitable giving. Those are all three things in end in themselves that have a value in continue working. There's a lot of side benefits also. You keep healthier, by the way, when you're working rather than when you're retired, right? That becomes a different word from retiree. I don't want to say that word, but you know, that's what happens because you don't use your mind. You become re, right? <laughs> it's, by the way, it's not a joke. It happens. That's what happens. Because you know you don't you don't use it you lose it exactly right so very good all right so we've been speaking about the need for the material world to be engaged in, right? Not to remove ourselves, on the contrary. It serves as an end in itself. It's a part of purpose, right? God didn't create purpose only on Shabbos. He didn't create only purpose when you come to synagogue. He created purpose in everything that you do. So that means that there's a value, inherent value and an end in itself, in the work that we do, right? But of course, <laughs> um, we need to know that 
just like in every area in life, the fact that we are successful is a result of God's blessings and his gift, right? All the more so when it comes to financial success, right? No different. All the effort that we put in is ultimately a divine kindness that we have success. And therefore, what we need to do is elicit that divine kindness. So you might think, well, work hard, you'll get divine kindness. That's true, but that's not sufficient. Because working hard means what? That, that you are just engaged in the a material world, and perhaps you're divorcing it from the spiritual world. And that, of course, will be, a, a, you know, a difficulty and a challenge. So therefore, we need to strengthen our faith. We need to st strengthen our relationship with God. And um, that is key in order to gain God's blessings in the work that we do. So the first and foremost thing is, of course, faith. Right? And God's blessing. That itself is a catalyst for blessings themselves. That's It's, it's a key. In other words, What's what's important over here, it's not like, you know, if you do for me, I'll do for you. You know, you scratch my back, I'll, I'll scratch your back. In other words, this will bring something, right? No, it's, it's a direct catalyst. Faith creates a reality. Lack of faith creates a reality. Let's understand what that means. Text number seven. I received your letter in which you write about your anxiety in regard to the question of Parnassus livelihood. You surely know how often our sages have impressed on us the importance of trust and confidence in God in order that we realize that all our difficulties are encountered in life are only trials and tests of a passing nature. To be sure, the question of Parnassus livelihood is one of the most difficult tests. Nevertheless, God does not subject one to a greater test than he can withstand, as our rabbis expressed it, according to the camel, so it's load. The very trust in God is a vessel and a channel to receive God's blessing. Apart from the fact that such confidence is good for one's health and disposition, and therefore is also a natural means to, uh, to the desired end. This is very important. The Rebbe is saying trust is itself creates the channel of the blessing. It's not like, oh, now God, I'm trusting in you. So the reward will be that I'm going to, you know, have plenty. No, 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 no. The trust itself creates the reality of having plenty. Yes. What's the difference between trust and faith? Faith is I believe in God. Trust is that when I'm down and out, but when I'm down and out, I'm trusting that God is going to take care of me. I believe that God. It's a belief. I believe it's a it's a it's an it's an abstract belief. Trust is in the moment when you are challenged. I am trusting in God that He will come through and help me. So in the moment of the challenge, where you're feeling the the angst, you have anxiety. In that moment, you feel. The anxiety taken off, the weight off your shoulders is removed, and because you have trust, God's going to take care. Belief is a, a general, you know, theory, right? You believe, but that doesn't mean when it comes down to it, do you act, actually so trust? Faith, faith, faith. Belief and faith are similar. Yes, trust is in the in the moment of the challenge. You are trusting. Okay. It's sort of like that. It's the trust is the emotional um, disposition in the moment that you have a challenge that you are trusting. Faith is a belief, it's not an emotional disposition, it's a belief. But that doesn't mean beliefs we live with. All right. As um, you know, we can have uh, we can have uh, um, cognitive dissonance, right? <laughs> we know one thing and we do another thing, 
right? Is that clear? Good, excellent. Okay. So we're speaking so much about work and that work has these three huge ends in themselves, a dwelling place for God, a way to engage people in their lives where they're at and to be able then to do so much, so much more for the community. But there is a time to say no to work. There is a time. What's that time called? Shabbos. Shabbos. <laughs> it's called Shabbos. Close for Shabbos, right? Which is a, a challenge. Because for some people who work retail, that's the day where they make their pay. And if they're closed on Shabbos, ooh, that becomes a huge sacrifice because it will hurt their bottom line. But hey, if that's what God wants, that's what we got to do. So that is the attitude many people have. I mean, I would say many. Some people have. Many people, they don't close on Shabbos, right? <laughs> but many have that attitude. Okay, that's what God wants, you know? I got to bite the bullet, and so on. That's not the Rebbe's perspective. Because that, that would suggest that the physical and the spiritual are two different realities, right? So therefore, if I do something spiritual, if I do something for God that therefore that will minimize something in the physical reality of my life. And for Rebbe, that's not a reality. That's not a possibility even. Not even a possibility. You hear that? Not even a possibility. Sounds very counterintuitive because after all, come on, let's be frank. If you're in retail, there's no question, Saturday is the biggest day. Right. What about when someone has an online business? Okay, the the details of it we're not going to go into right now about what that what that means. So you have go ask your local Orthodox rabbi. I I'm, I'm just Jewish. Jewish? <laughs> yeah, so don't ask me the question. <laughs> that, that's no. that's a good question. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> as much as you. <laughs> All right, text number eight. A Rebbe course, uh, the Rebbe's correspondence is clear to an unbiased mind and even to a plain common sense. Listen, this is what the Rebbe writes that the Almighty, who's the giver of the Torah and mitzvahs, and is also, by the way, the, the creator and master of the world, whose benevolent providence extends to everyone individually. It is also equally obvious that no lasting good can come from breaking God's law especially such a fundamental law as Shabbos observance. For the important thing is not how much money a person earns, but that he should be able to spend it in good health and unhappy things, which is entirely in the hands of God. In view of the above, it is quite clear what your attitude of business is in question should be, even if there were no other immediate business proposition. For it's necessary without delay to give up the kind of business that interferes with Shabbos observance with full, with full confidence that he who feeds and sustains 3 billion people, that was, that was, uh, this is in uh, 1971, 50 odd years ago, right? And all living things will also be able to take care of the individual and his family and provide him with a source of Parnassus livelihood, which should not be in conflict with the will of God. That is very important. It was not necessarily always, it, it was always, a, it's a sentiment in Torah, but not always was it the sentiment that was pronounced by leaders because it was a huge sacrifice. When you came to America, right, before the war or even after the war, how many people worked six days and then 
What happened on the eighth day? They had to find a new job. They had to find a new job. They didn't go to they didn't go to they didn't go to shul. They didn't go to work on Shabbos. They didn't have a job on 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 Sunday. What what Monday? Sunday. They didn't have a job on Sunday, and they did that week after week. That's a huge test. The Rebbe is saying that actually more than that. There's no doubt if we have trust in God, and this is trust, right? When you're going something through that, that God will provide. It's not possible if you're going to listen to what God says that he will not provide. Now, you can throw yourself under the bus and not trust in God, but then you didn't create the funnel, the channel to be a conduit for that blessing. So it's not enough that you just keep Shabbos. You have to also believe that was the first point we made. Second point is one needs to do what you need to do. I start a store, clothing store in downtown Los Angeles, 3,000 square feet store. I really seriously was seeing myself like, we want to close the, the store on Shabbos. I don't want to work on Shabbos. But it was difficult to think like this because most of the business you're doing on Shabbos. There was some Shabbos I used to sell $5,000, $10,000, $15,000 on Shabbos. During the week, barely, I can sell $100, $150. The contract, the lease I have, I was obligated, 20 years lease. The owner, he warning me in the beginning, if you ever was thinking to leave this lease, I'm going to run after you to the rest of your life. I'm not going to let you go out from it. So I wrote to the Rebbe, told them, Rebbe, I decide to close my store on Shabbos. I would like to have a blessing. I should not get hurt. I'm getting a letter, and in the envelope I open, I see $18, and then it says, Echad, Matchil Mikodem Shkiat Achama Vegadol Aschut, Shnaim, Lafitz Tatora Mitoch Simcha, Shalosh Latet Zdaka Shama, to give Zdaka at the money what he gave me. The next day I say, I'm going to go to the landlord, and I'm going to give him the lease, and the landlord was not there. I came back to my store. There is a guy walking to my store. He wants to buy the store, he's telling me. So I told him, go to the landlord. He's telling me, I was with the landlord. I said, what the landlord told you? He said, you're holding the lease. Ata marzik ta He took a checkbook and uh, he wrote me a nice check. I just can tell you, with this check, I bought a house and I started manufacturing. And I remember going to the Rebbe and on Sunday, I told the Rebbe, Rebbe, I got a miracle with the store. The Rebbe was laughing and he went like this on my mouth, like, don't talk about this. Okay, you got the words there. I started my practice on New Lots Avenue, and things looked very bleak. It wasn't going anywhere. I remember having a friend. I happened to have mentioned to him that I was having some problems. This young man yeah. suggested that the Rebbe would be able to help but, me. So put it up loud. And so I made an appointment him. with the Rebbe. I started to tell him I wasn't doing well here in Brooklyn and I was able to find a place in Bayside. I was going to be starting an office there. He said, do you, do you work on Shabbos? And I said, yes, I do. And he says, now you're going to a new place. He says, you're moving. Perhaps you want to think about not working on Shabbos. It became known that Dr. Walensky did not, doesn't work on Saturday. It was unheard of. Dr. Walensky goes to a shul. I was very... What happened there? It's off, it's off there too. Mm -hmm. Cut. All right. Whatever.
Okay. It's okay. Oh, here. Oh, it's here that's the problem. Okay, sorry. We got a bit of a... Ay, ay, ay. Technology. Ah, he's IT. He's it. <laughs> yes. Remember playing tag as a kid. You can remember for that far back. Huh? You can remember that far back. Yeah. And yeah, now it became IT. <laughs> Okay. All right. So you got the gist of it there. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, look what happened here. Oh, it's free. Oh, it's free. All right, folks. What's that online? So they online, they do have here too. It'll be good here. No, I have to redo it here. So I have to stop sharing then, no? Not necessarily. No, how about, I, I don't see, look oh, on the I bottom know. here. I don't see in the bottom here. Where? No. Yeah, you have to unshare. Unshare yeah. this one. What's insightful is the, uh, his intonation when you're telling his, his, his emphasis on the festival, and it wasn't enough to honor Shabbat. Right. Because uh, festivals during the week, you know, if someone doesn't have retail stores, so it might be easier for Shabbos, right? They don't work on the weekend. It's working. It's almost like you put equal weight on it. The default speaker has changed. Something the default look what it says here. What is that? It's working? It's going to be. Sorry, folks. How's everybody doing there? Do you still have your international people there? Yes. So it's not connecting. Oops. Ay, 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 ay. Okay. Amit? Somehow we got to make this. I'm connecting there. Uh, take something to drink, have some sushi. It's connecting? No. Have a lachayim. Connected? No. Huh? No, no, it's, it shows here still connecting. Didn't say that it didn't connect. Are you, what did you do? No, it's connecting. Hmm? No, couldn't connect. Try again or pause. I'm gonna risk it. Hey. The worst technology comes from the cool that that happened. Hebrew starts the language. It's being started, just make another button. How's everybody doing? You enjoying the videos? Yeah, you liking the videos? Yeah, they're good. I think so. I I think I'll have. Um, I I have. To, I think so. What am I doing? Okay, try. So generally, if you go to jail, jail live to the course, aren't the videos posted there? I'm not certain. What do you report us? Huh? I thought you would know this. I know some things, and some things I don't. Try WD forty for the doors. Yes. Ah, no. Duplicate. What am I doing? Extended. Oh, we're back. We're back. We're back. Okay, we're back. Funny how that worked out. Oops. How do we go over here? No, that's not what we want. Let me tell the where should where should I be sharing over here? 
It's fine. Yes, sir. Good. It's up here. Mm -hmm. All right. Next thing. So again, we spoke about the importance of, of engaging in the work, engaging it in material world, in work, the importance and the value of it, right? But of course, what can happen is we can be disconnected from the spiritual truth. So the first thing is, as we mentioned, is trust, faith, and having trust in God, closing on Shabbos, observance, observance of Torah mitzvahs, but in particular, it's time off for Torah. Right, that is the particular of of in particular importance. We can get so you know engaged, engaged in 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 the material world. As a, a chassid came to the Rebbe Rashab and he opened up a, a big factory making galoshes, and he was speaking to him about the business, and he commented to him. He says, "I've seen feet in galoshes." You know what galoshes are, right? Mm -hmm. Rubbers. I've seen feet in galoshes, but I haven't seen a head in galoshes. Right. In other words, it's one thing to engage in business and to use your acumen for it, but leave your real head for study of Torah. Right. To use your mind, don't use it just for business. Don't have your head in galoshes. Have your head in Torah study. That's truly important uh and and not not just because of course you know how could you not have torah in your life but vis-a-vis -vis business even how important it is to be successful in the business world and you are divorced from the study of torah will mitigate your success text number nine please although this eats into the time that usually uh, dedicated to work, not only will the study not detract from your overall success, but to the contrary, says the Rebbe. Torah study clears and refines the mind to be able to make better business decisions with greater clarity and efficiency. It calms the spirit, leading to greater success in business and greater happiness in life, period. This phenomenon is expressed clearly in the Torah itself. If you go in my way and fulfill my commandments, I will provide rain in an optimal time. When you dedicate time for Torah study, we are guaranteed the divine blessings for success in a way that is optimal without stress and worry. Especially if you use your if your business for as a Chabad house, meaning you have a lunch and learn at your place of business, right? <laughs> so you're using it as a vehicle for, uh, in a divine manner. And the final thing is of course, we all believe the value of charity, of philanthropy, and often it feels good to give, but sometimes not so easy to give because it hurts, right? So here's another key. Not only Torah study, not only Torah study is doesn't hinder your work, it will enhance your business life, Right, that's that's counterintuitive. More time I spend in business, if I'm going to spend an hour a day working, uh, studying in my business. That's taking an hour from business. I'll study at night when I'm tired. Like people are a little tired now, right? Spend that hour also during the day. That's counterintuitive. That's my work time. That's where I got to focus. No, that I'm just saying the opposite. There's another thing: is giving money is a sense that I'm taking away something from me. Now, I got to do it. It's a mitzvah. I have obligation. I've got to give uh, 10%. Fine. But it is taking away. So why should it hurt? Because it's taking away something from me. Right? The Rebbe says the opposite. The Rebbe says the opposite. By giving tzedakah, and the more you give, actually, what are you in fact doing? What are you doing? You're opening channels to receive more. Why? Why? Because you're 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 making Hashem happy. More than that. You're you're making God your partner. You've got a partner in your business now, God Almighty. And 
what greater partner could you have? So if you think of your business and giving tzedakah in that manner, it's not going to hurt. Not only won't hurt, it's going to help. That's counterintuitive. I got to do it. Get it. When you got to do something, it hurts, by the way. When you want to do it, because this increases your partner's engagement in your business, he's going to give you more. Oh, now you sing and dance doing it. Very different. Text number 10. I hope that from now on you will realize more fully and confidently that God is your partner in the business by virtue of the tzedakah charity stake in it. And of course, the larger the share of the tzedakah, the larger is the share of the partnership. So you can boldly, so you can go boldly ahead on a broader front. I hope to hear good news from you. God is your partner, and the more you invest in him, the greater the partnership he invests back in you. Wow. Oh, no. Why is this not working? My uh, business is something very bad. Hold on a second. You can give me a rough estimate. Oh, no. Oh, here it's now working. No. Huh? Sorry, folks. It's something got to do with the... Uh, here, come over here. It says digital output. Is that what I want? For speaker? Or, spe or this one? No. Digital output. That's the one. No, that, that's where it was. Yeah. It's just a real cool thing. It's causing a problem. It would be slow in the next one. That's what? Well, that's what I was thinking. Oh. The internet speed. Could you disconnect and reconnect? Is it's not, it's not, it's not running no, no, forget it. It's too late. Running off a program. Okay. I'm sorry, folks. Okay, how do I get this to go? You know, let's go back. Then we'll go forward. All right. You can watch, folks. You hear it? Then? My business has been very bad. Watching? I hope to God you can give me a rough estimate. You will put a Zuckerberg in your business and yes. arrange to have at least 10% given for the net income of the business to Zuckerberg. To challenge. Here, you're not hearing? Yeah, good very much. Let's have good news. I didn't share it. Thank you very much. I didn't share it. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you very now it stops. All right. We got the gist of it. <laughs> we got the gist of it. 10%. Yeah. The Rebbe then went further and said, not only about the giving tzedakah, but to make a pushka, a charity box, in every office, in every home. And not only that, in your home, put it on the wall. Fasten it to the wall. Have one charity box fastened to the wall. Why? Because now the house becomes a vehicle of charity. The house now is null of Imagine, you have a little box like this. We have in our kitchen. They ever said in a place like kitchen is the best place because that's where you're off and around. If you do wish that is. <laughs> right. Have a pushka all fastened, not next to the wall. Fasten to the wall. 
that means it's part of the house. So the house now becomes nullified to the pushka. It becomes now a charity home. Not it's a home that gives charity. The home is charity. It nullified to the pushka because that's the most important thing is the fact that now your home is, right? That's in, in a spiritual term, obviously, right? Not uh, physically, it's a very small little thing, the pushka there. But that's what they're going to be. Uh, asked everybody. Children ha should have their own pushka in their room. Why? Not, not because the institutions are going to become uh, wealthy through this, and not because the, the poor will not will have enough to feed themselves. It's because you are teaching in uh, the, the quality of giving, constantly giving. You have a pushka wherever you go, you see a pushka, and you have, you give. It's not about how much you give. It's about the fact that you're giving. That you're, that's what we are, giving people. Now we have the final video. It's a real important one. Okay, we got, this, you're, the last try over here. Folks, thank you for your, says your default speaker has changed to digital. Uh, zero. I, I think. No, I'll try to come. Yeah. yeah. I mean, up here? Yeah, not connected? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's good. Not yet. We're here. Duplicate? Where am I? Or extend, right? Uh, extend, right? Extend, yeah. Oh, no. So it's on there. Okay. We are already connected. So could you go back? Change equals 55 to 75. Hey, can you take a message for me? Tell them I'll call them back. It's a I do it. I see. It's like Siri talking uh, when you never asked her a question. I don't know, you share it. This one? Yes. Or maybe you should go to this one. Friends. No, they don't see anything in the back. You don't see? Huh? Nothing here? Connect again. Go share or connect again. No, why, why should it work if it didn't work till now? I can just turn this around for the last one so people could see. One last try. Okay, last try. Did you disconnect the row code in the past? Uh, connected okay we're, that's it finished okay man all right uh duplicate don't don't extend duplicate this one that is connected connected perfect. it's brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. perfect yes it's the okay rivka blau is the daughter of rabbi mordechai pinchas tights a prominent rabbinic activist and chief rabbi of Elizabeth, New Jersey. In 1961, she was vice president of Yavna, one of the first Orthodox student organizations on American college campuses. Our mission statement was that we wanted to promote Jewish learning and Jewish observance on campus, and that we wanted to, I can't, I don't remember the exact wording, but that we wanted to enable people who want to know more about their Jewishness to find out, but we knew we had to know more if we were going to be that kind of a presence on campus. It was essentially Jewish learning, Jewish observance, not to feel so alone. And that if people wanted to learn more, we would be available to help them. Those were pretty much the, that was the essence of the mission statement. And at that time we already had, I think, between 13 and 15 uh, college groups involved. And, um, and we also had isolated students in different places. At Rutgers, we had three or four students. At University of Pennsylvania, we had some students. 
Now, at that time, the Lubavitch Rebbe had a representative who would come to Colombia and who got friendly with the president of Yavne, uh, Joel Levine. And this young man, uh, his last name was Feller, um, uh, told Joel and me, well, actually he told Joel first and then Joel told me, that he wanted to meet with two officers of Yavne and to talk to us about how we had gotten started and what we were doing. Our appointment was for 10 o'clock at night, so we came to 770 Eastern Parkway at um, 10 o'clock at night, and we were asked to come in to see the Rebbe at 12 o'clock. And he asked us many detailed questions about how we had started, how we had found each other, what we were finding on campus, what were the problems, what were the possibilities, what opportunity was there for people who were interested in finding more about their Jewishness, uh, how could we reach them, uh, what do we find worked well, what do we find, what we found did not work. Very, very to-the-point questions. Uh, at the end he said, well, I've asked you a lot of questions, would you like to ask me some questions? And I, I had no questions to ask of the Rebbe. I was, thought that this was a wonderful meeting that we had just now had, and I said, no, thank you. And the fellow who was with me said, well, yes, I've spent a Shabbos or two here in Crown Heights, courtesy of this uh, young man that I know from Lubavitch, and I hear all kinds of wonder stories about you. I hear that you know better than the doctor whether there should be surgery or not. You know better than the lawyer which way to proceed with a case. Do you know more medicine than the doctors? Do you know more law than the lawyers? I mean, what kind of thing is this? So the Rebbe smiled and um, he said, you know, when a house gets built, uh, the architect draws up a blueprint. He gives the blueprint to the contractor. And then the contractor tells the plumber how to do the plumbing, the mason how to do the masonry, the electrician how to do the electricity, the electrical work. He said, it's not that the contractor can do it better than everybody but he can read the blueprint, and that's why he can give the instructions. So he said, Hashem is taka baraiso vara alma, the blueprint of the world is the Torah. So if somebody can understand Torah, he can tell other people what they have to do within their own metier. That's very powerful. That brings to a, a close a question that we asked at the very beginning. How is it that the Rebbe can answer these questions literally? So when we understand that the Torah is the blueprint of creation, the five books of Moses, and not just the five books of Moses, but all of the oral Torah, the Talmud, the Zohar, the Tanya, it's all part of the blueprints of creation. And when you know the blueprints, and you can read the architectural plan, then you understand, you can pinpoint everything in the blueprints. So you know who's in the blueprints? I'm there. You're there. Each and every one of us. Exactly where we need to be in building God's edifice in this world building a home for God. We all have a place that we need to do that and in a manner and how we need to do that, how to do it, with what to do it, and all of those details, the one who's going to give us the greatest guidance, there's no doubt about it because it's proven over time of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people and what they have asked their Rebbe for guidance and how it has helped their lives. So that's where we are. And we will uh, continue, God willing, next week with Family Bliss. A clarity on family relations, domestic harmony, education, and creating a healthy home environment. Shh. Just as this has been phenomenal, next week will also be. So a Lesson little review. One. Meaning at work. One, people consulted with the Rebbe regarding all areas of life in the belief that his advice stemmed from a deep understanding of the Torah. Two, work is not just a necessary means of obtaining a livelihood to sustain more elevated achievements, 
but it has inherent value and purpose. God designed the world in a way that we are forced to spend the majority of our time engaged in work because bringing holiness and Torah values into the mundane workplace is the ultimate purpose of creation. 3. The workplace also affords us unique opportunities to inspire others to be better people. And earning money enables us to partner with God by giving charity to others. 4. The Rebbe was critical of retirement, seeing that work is our means of fulfilling our life purpose. 5. Spiritual investment holds the secret to success in all areas of life, including financial. The Rebbe emphasized the importance of faith in God, Shabbat observance, setting aside time for Torah study, and giving charity as keys to financial success. All right. Thank you, folks. Any questions? Thanks for the lesson. Pleasure. How much? Six. Any questions, folks? Yes. I mean, that's a spin off of according to the cut, yes. But the goal, I assume, primary goal is to learn to learn how to take the money and to get Torah. So David's asking a very good question. Aren't we supposed to learn Torah, uh, Lishma, for its own value, for its own sake? And, you know, here there was a spin given to it that, you know, learning Torah is going to make you better at your business. So I guess it depends. Um, I guess it depends why you're doing your business. If your business is in order to make money so you could help and do more good and you can make more of an effect on in people's lives, so then that's lishma, right? Then, then, then fine. Then that means your Torah learning is also for the sake of Torah learning. The byproduct will be that it's also going to help you in business. So you're right. Torah, you should learn for the sake and the value of Torah itself, that it's God's wisdom, period, a hundred percent. But at the same time, you see, at the same time, you see, and this is the key. We we have a a a, na a natural um, um, disposition of creating dualism. Why? Why do we create dualism? You know why? Because there's up, down, there's right, left. There's good, bad, there's light, dark. Everything is dualism, so, right? That's how we perceive the world naturally. But to recognize that there isn't a dualism, there's a oneness, right? So in that oneness is my learning Torah is one thing and my business is another thing. It's two different worlds. No, it's the same world. They interface. They got to come together. They're the flip side of the same coin. That's the, that is the counterintuitive thing that the Rebbe is coming to negate. And therefore, don't think that your studying of Torah, yes, it's got to be for the sake of Torah, but then, but then that's taking away for the sake of business and taking away from livelihood and taking away from what I can do for the community. I got to put more efforts in my work because I, I made an obligation to give a million dollars to Chabad. Right, and I got to come through, so I got to work harder. So I'm not going to learn Torah because I'm got. No, they're going to be saying, no, 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 learn the Torah. <laughs> if you'll learn, it's going to be the vehicle to bring bring that that million that million dollar charitable capability. You know, that's what it's going to do. So that's counterintuitive. That's what the Rebbe is saying. That makes sense. But how? <laughs> Until you leave. Well, I think that uh, it's all the same thing. And like she said, Torah for self advancement. If you advance yourself by studying the Torah, it is for yourself, which provides an avenue for doing the other things, for providing for others, for making the, uh, 
our world a better place for everyone. So it's self-defense, that's what you're studying for. Yeah, that uh, that's for sure. But again, the 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 nuance over here is that it, you know it it will take it can take away or at least it's not helping anything. It's helping in my spiritual life, but my material life is my material life. That's dualism. And but we naturally are that way. We, and let's not let's not fool ourselves. We're all that way. Not that we don't so what do we do? We go, we binge on the on the spirituality, and then we, you know, we, we binge on the uh, the materialism because we don't see the interface. Here we're talking about the interface. It's not dualism. In other words, your learning is not only not detracting; it's actually helping your in your business. That's the point. That it's helping in your business life. That's a unique uh, way to look at things. That's that's a unique way to look at it. No, that's not natural. We don't naturally, intuitively would look at things that way. That that's the point, right? I, I hope that's clear. I mean, yeah. 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 All right. All right. I wake up in terms of time. How do I divide up my twenty-four hours a day? But it's actually the quality of what you do because you're less work, less work, and I'm thinking much more. Spending space throughout work, for Right. Yeah. Yes, David. But, um, <clears throat> what we're streaming defines spatial meaning in the material world. So if one works, you can find the, the purpose of the work that brings some goodness into this world. Example, let's say somebody works in McDonald's and he's tired and but he works, he washes the dishes, he serves and so on. One would say, well, he works for a living, but no, he feeds the people. And right. people go on, on with their lives and they do other things. It's a chain, you know, just one link in the chain. And so there is no separation from material and spiritual. The only thing that we benefit by learning Torah right. is we're learning wiser way, proper way, Connection to Hashem. Yep. And that's the whole goal. Yeah. Yeah. I heard a story about a guy who was working at the space station a few years ago. And uh, he was actually a, a cleaner. And someone came to visit him and they were talking you know, louder so can they can everybody louder so everybody can hear you. At NASA space station, and there was a cleaner there. I think somebody was coming around to, to visit everyone there. Um, but he, he didn't introduce himself as a cleaner. He said, I'm helping put man on the moon. <laughs> Which is true. Yeah. I hope he didn't do I, I hope he didn't do it just for the honor. He did it because he, he believed it. <laughs> All right. Herschel? All right. All right, folks. Thank you very much. A pleasure. God bless you all. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. Whoever didn't get a chance to sign up, please make sure Rena knows because we're ordering our books tomorrow just in case uh, someone did not sign up yet so we know how many books to get. Thank you.